and welcome to episode 145 of the DBR podcast. We are coming to you. Uh, we're here on Monday night, January 28th, just a little over an hour after the conclusion of the Duke Notre Dame game. Uh, Duke went 3-0 and over the last eight days, and we're going to cover everything tonight. First, we'd like to start by thanking our wonderful sponsors at Bird Campbell for their continued support of this podcast. Bird Campbell, your Duke-centric law firm with law offices in Texas and Florida. Bird Campbell means business. And I'm your host this week, Donald Wine here, coming to you from my home in Washington, D.C., a city that is now back to work for now. Um, my two homies are here with me first in Atlanta. We have Jason Evans. Jason, I hear you got snow coming tomorrow. That's what they say. I don't believe it. And even if we do get some snow, it's too warm. Like, this is Atlanta weather for you. It's like in the 50s and 60s today. And then they go, oh, it's going to drop it. We're going to get snow tomorrow. Like, and with me, I, I, I can't get excited about it. I don't think it's going to be a big deal. And then watch the city. We'll have another snowmageddon where the city is completely frozen and no one goes anyplace for 24 hours. Who knows? Yeah, well, you have the Super Bowl coming up, so you, you better you better get moving. Uh, and by the way, the, la- the last time Atlanta hosted a Super Bowl, the weather was lousy and everyone hated the city for it. So it's yeah. our fault. It's all our yeah. fault. It's always your fault. Um, let's bring in the resident Dermite, uh, Sam Klein. What's going on, man? You guys are really talking about the weather while Trey Jones is back and Duke is is looking again like perhaps the the, the hottest, most awesome team in the country. I mean, look, I, I love a good weather discussion. Obviously, Durham has been has been weather central uh, for the last six months. But uh, come on, guys, what, what, what are we doing here? OK, well, I mean, <laughs> like I like snow. I like snow. I, I don't get a lot of snow, but you know what? You're right. Trey Jones is back. But let's get into all the basketball uh, so as I previously mentioned, Duke had three games last week. First, last Tuesday night, the Blue Devils traveled to Pittsburgh to face the Pitt Panthers. The first time Coach K faced off against his protege, Jason Cable. Uh, Duke Jason won Cable. that. Who, who's Jason Cable? Who's Jason? Jeff Cable. Jeff, Jeff Cable. Cable. Jason Cable's his brother. Jason's an, keeping, he's, he's an assistant. I didn't realize that watching he the is game. An assistant. I saw Jason Cable on the brother. bench, and I didn't realize that, that Jason Cable was Jeff Cable's assistant. That's cool. Anyway. Anyway, uh, you know what? I'm leaving that in it, anyway. It, oh, uh, it, it was it was Kay's first time facing off against Jason Capel as well. There so you, I was okay. right. So he didn't get it. He didn't, I, didn't, I don't yeah. know that Jason Capel would, would count as a protege. Well, he is now. <laughs> 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 because Duke won that game, 79-64. Saturday, Georgia Tech, the return of Trey Jones, as, uh, as Sam alluded to earlier. Georgia Tech actually led at the half by this one. Duke pulled away 66-53. Finally, as I mentioned this evening, we went 3-0 against Notre Dame, 83-61 the final score. So, guys, what we're going to do is going to take each of these games one at a time. So, beforehand, for those of you out there, we each picked a game to recap. So, I'm going to start with Pitt. Pitt was a game that Duke started out kind of slow, and, and Pitt was hanging with them. But Zion, like early on, just said, you know what, enough of this crap. And uh, took over. And at the end of uh, the first half was 44-25. But I remember at halftime, Jeff Capel, not Jason Capel, Jeff Capel basically said, I don't know what we're going to do about Zion Williamson. Maybe we just get more physical with him and, and hope that works. It it didn't. Zion ended up with 25 points, seven rebounds, seven assists, two steals, and one block. RJ Barrett added 26 points. Cam Reddish had 15 points. Even with all those numbers, we didn't shoot well. But I think that, you know, a lot of these guys had key moments during the game where they knocked down important baskets and or made a great pass or made a great defensive stop. And that really took the mojo out of uh, the zoo, as they called up in pit. Uh, I will shout out Marquise Bolden, who had seven key points, nine great rebounds and four incredible blocks on the night in 30 minutes, especially uh, with Trey Jones still out for this game him stepping up and putting 30 minutes in of productive work in a big way really helped this team. Pitt is a scrappy team. We mentioned before that they're a team that's not going to be an easy out, and they played like that last Tuesday night. But Duke was victorious in a game that once we hit the second half wasn't really in doubt, but we we ended up with a, a hard-fought victory over the Pitt Panthers. Before we move on, Jason or Sam, did you have anything to add on the Pitt game? Um, that's, it was, what, that's kind of no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it was, I, I, I was going to say that, um, that Duke and, and coach K and, and nobody let the sort of emotion of playing against Jeff Capel kind of 
kind of slow them down. Um, they were very businesslike about the whole thing, and I was I was happy about that. Of course, ESPN couldn't stop talking about the 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 Duke and Jeff Capel thing, um, but it it didn't show on the court. Duke, of course, was was leading by almost twenty points at halftime, and and didn't make this a game. We've talked on the show about what a great job Capel has done this season so far at Pittsburgh, at bringing them from the the very very bottom of the ACC, like worse than like much worse than the usual worst team in the ACC is um, bringing them back to a place where they could still qualify for the NCAA tournament. It's not likely that they're going to do so, but they have, they have far exceeded uh, any expectations that, that any reasonable minds had about them this year, but Duke didn't let that get to them. And, and like you said, Donald, the, the star of the night was Zion Williamson um, 11 for 13 from the field and, and just all over the place. And I know that we're going to talk about him again, as we, Definitely as we get to the Notre Dame game, but Marquise Bolden has really improved uh, the last few weeks. And I, I think we've seen him step up in a way that we that we on this show did not entirely expect. Um, yeah. so, but, but we'll definitely get to him more when we when we talk about Notre Dame. Yeah, I really can't say enough about Marquise um, and how he played. Uh, I, you Again, he played well against Notre Dame, but against Pitt, I think in, in stepping up when you have a key guy like Trey Jones out, it's not like they play the same position, you know, far from it. But when you're asked to play 30 minutes when you're normally expected to play, you know, 15 to 20, that's a big step up. And and, and he did not have a drop off in his game with the increase in minutes. And I think that's very easy to do for someone who is not used to playing 30 minutes. But Marquis Bolden performed very well and was every time he was out in the court, he was doing something to change the game. And I think that is what you need. From, from guys like Marquise, guys like Javon Delorier, Jack White. You know, those guys need to make sure that they are, are, are changing the game when they get out in the court, and he did that on, on Tuesday night. So I was really proud of him for that. Next up, let's talk about Georgia Tech. Uh, you know, this is the game that saw Trey Jones return to the lineup. Jason, why don't you recap our victory against the Yellow Jackets for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Josh Pastner um, – Really, he he was openly saying that he needed to ugly up this game. He needed to, you know, Georgia Tech is a team that relies on their defense. They're they're actually one of the better defensive teams in the ACC. Um, uh, you know, arguably even you know, just a, a small step behind Duke and Virginia uh, as the best defensive teams in the conference. And and Passner really wanted to make this a game that would be really slow, not a lot of possessions. Um, and, and, and where Duke would, you know, struggle to get anything, you know, going in much of a flow Georgia tech played a zone virtually the entire, the entire game. Um, they held Duke to our lowest point total of the year. Um, it was our second worst game of the year in terms of field goal efficiency. We couldn't hit an outside shot to save our life. I mean, we're, we're talking about Duke wasn't even hitting 10%, not even 10% of their three-pointers. All of these things are a formula for Georgia Tech to, to pull off the unlikely, to pull off uh, the, the incredible upset. And, and, um, and in the first half, I think Duke seemed really out of sorts on offense. Um, we, we, made, uh, we, we fueled um, a late first half run by Georgia Tech because our offense was so bad. We were turning the ball over. We were getting quality shots. And as a result, Tech was able to get some easier baskets. And um, and Tech actually went into the locker room with, with a lead. Um, and and they got, you know, they got kind of hot a little bit early in the second half. And with almost 16 minutes to go, Georgia Tech led Duke 38-31. I don't know that anyone was that worried. I wasn't. I was watching the game and I was like, I know that this Duke team is going to turn it on. We've been a second half team all year. But, you know, props to Tech for having a seven point lead with 1545 to go. Because at that point, Cam Reddish hit a three pointer. Duke went on a 21 to four run and we actually ended up outscoring them 35 to 15 the rest of the way. And we we coasted for a fairly easy victory, which which is what you would expect Duke to do at home against a team like Georgia Tech that's really not all that good. Um, I, I really liked a couple of the things we did. I want to highlight, uh, you know, a few little things. One is um, against this Georgia Tech zone, which I mentioned was a really, really good zone. Um, Duke was able to a, a couple times get some lobs over the back of the zone. Cam Reddish especially did a nice job of lobbing to Zion Williamson. Um, 
and and then Zion was able to get you know sometimes he got slam dunks out of it and sometimes he got you know just a a basket um but but that's really important because I think teams are going to zone Duke more and more and more I mean you can't guard these guys man to man you can't guard Zion or RJ man to man you just can't and and to be honest you can't guard Trey Jones man to man because he's probably going to be able to break his man down and create a shot for someone else so teams are going to play zone so I liked seeing Duke battling against this really good Georgia Tech zone and and getting some easy shots out of it. And then the other thing I thought we did really, really well is we got to the free throw line and we made our free throws. And we had to because there's no other place in this game where where Duke was really performing at a, at a really high level, at least offensively. Um, but But it's important for Duke to be able to get those easy points at the free throw line. We don't get extra points from three-pointers. So we've got to get points at the free throw line. And this was a game where Duke really won it at the free throw line. And then the last thing I wanted to mention before I toss it to you guys was Alex O'Connell, who who played 19 minutes in this game. That was the fifth most minutes on the team. And it's very rare for us to see AOC getting the fifth most minutes on the on the team. For O'Connell to play that much shows you that he was playing really well. Um, and he had a stretch in the second half. I, I'm guessing – you know, top of my head, I think Alex O'Connell played the final 10 minutes of the game. Um, he he had some key offensive rebounds. Um, I think uh, he didn't hit his three pointers, but I think the threat of him as a as a good three point shooter, because let's be honest, Duke doesn't have many guys who you go, uh oh, they're taking a three. It's almost like, yay, they're taking a three. So the threat of Alex taking three pointers, I think, opened up the Georgia Tech defense a little bit and created opportunities for some other guys. I thought he was very active on defense. He was really active on the boards. Um, like I said, offensive rebounds, he got some good defensive rebounds as well. Um, Alex O'Connell had a, had, you know, arguably his best game, I think uh, this season for, for Duke. And uh, it's so important because he had been struggling. His minutes had been dwindling recently. And, and I was really happy to see him get that nice run. He, he then, you know, as we transitioned to the Notre Dame game, he, he, he played really well down the stretch against Notre Dame as well and got a couple buckets and stuff. So um, I, I was glad to see those things happen. I think that's important. And, uh, you know, 66 to 53, it was, uh, it was a very pedestrian win for the Blue Devils against a team that's overmatched, but, but fought hard and, and played, you know, as well as they could probably. Yeah, I think, Jason, there were a couple of, of things that you noted in there that I, I think are worth highlighting again. The first being that Georgia Tech successfully kind of trapped Duke with that zone. Um, we obviously know that Duke lost at home to Syracuse, also employing the zone really well. And certainly part of that was Jones being out. But some of it is attributable to Duke's offense just not being designed to to break the zone down and and them not really having the the tools to do that. So So props to Georgia Tech really for for limiting Duke as much as they did. As you said, Duke's lowest offensive output of the season, part of that was them taking threes, a lot of threes that they weren't comfortable with. And that's kind of what the zone is designed to do. So that made a lot of sense. The other thing I think that was interesting in this game is you you called out Alex O'Connell and the number of minutes he played. The rotation in this game was actually really different than I think any of us expected. It was certainly the first game with Trey Jones back. And we know how challenging it can be, even after only a few games, to reintegrate such a key player. Um, Duke fans, of course, remember the, the 2011 trying to figure out how to work Kyrie Irving back into the lineup come NCAA tournament time. The other big one, I think, that comes to mind that was very successful uh, was Ryan Kelly back in 2013. That that reintegration, I think, was <laughs> was easier than it's probably ever been for another player. You guys remember the the game in Cameron that he had against Miami where he made all those threes. Yeah, um, although it's worth noting it. that it's it's worth noting that Kelly had that huge game, but he wasn't he wasn't the same player after. Like that was the right the the uh, you know the energy of one game. It's not like exactly. he continued playing that way. Sorry, and, go and, ahead. And, and Trey Jones and Trey Jones came out really hyped to play in this game. He had that he had that look on his face, like oh yeah, like I'm I'm back. I'm ready to to make a difference here. But but you could tell that the rest of the team wasn't quite. Um, wasn't quite on on his level. I think it was also tough just having a noon game. It was kind of early in the day. The other thing that was interesting here, uh, Jason, that I'm surprised you didn't really bring up was Javin Delorier's lack of minutes in that game and then subsequently yeah. against Georgia Tech or against uh, Notre Dame, rather. Um, th- this is something that's, 
you know, I had mentioned a couple weeks ago on the show, right around when ACC season started, like, hey, this is the lineup. Um, this is how Coach K likes to do things. He likes to pick his starters. Maybe he has one key guy off the bench, and it seemed like it was Delorier with Bolden and, and Jack White getting getting some minutes off the bench, but not a ton. And we have seen the last few games, that's been kind of changing. Uh, Delorier is playing fewer minutes. Bolden has gotten the start the last two nights, or the last two games, rather, and uh, got the start against Notre Dame and played 20 minutes while, while Javin only played 11. Uh, as as we're sort of transitioning to the Notre Dame game, but um, wait, wait, but wait, yeah. wait! Bol- Bolden's been starting for a while now, and right, and as, and, as you know, I've been playing really, really well. And, and right, and so I was going to say that it's interesting because we don't normally see guys make such a leap during ACC season. Uh, I, th- I think the famous one that that we love talking about is Brian Zubek back in 2010. But the Marquise Bolden has been playing much better, I think, at both ends of the floor. I think we talked a little bit about how he was when he was in early in the season on defense he was kind of anchoring in the middle but could be exploited by being pulled out to the perimeter that's not really happening anymore he's he's good at maintaining his space inside and allows i think a lot of the perimeter defenders to sag a little bit because they know that he's going to be down there to to block shots and take up space Um, he's been doing that much more effectively and more notably on the offensive end he's really figured out the last few games how to Um, how to sort of take advantage of his limited offensive skill set, but also contribute in a big way, getting offensive boards, getting putbacks. Um, He's been, he's been playing a lot of garbage man down, uh, down low, especially at the offensive end for Duke. And that's been, I I think the the, the most incredible turnaround this season, or most incredible like progression for many of the players so far this year, in my opinion, has been bold in the last two weeks. I, I, I think you just cheated. I think you started talking about the Notre Dame game <laughs> when we were still but on the Georgia I think, Tech game. <laughs> I think we started seeing it. I think we started seeing it against Georgia Tech. Um, you know, you if you asked me a month ago, what do you feel like when Bolden comes into the game? I would say I'm I'm a little worried. I'm worried what he's going to do on offense. And now it feels like it feels like that perhaps the coaching staff or I don't know, sort of feels that way about Delorier and Bolden's taking a few more of his minutes. Do you mind if we if we leap into the the Notre Dame game from there? Because I think it's sort of the the appropriate no, no, it's transition. Ab- um, absolutely. Absolutely. Go for it. So so looking at, at Notre Dame, I, I think I think you got to start there with the way that Duke was able to just totally contain them inside. Um between Marquise Bolden and and Zion Williamson again a- appearing like a ghost uh, to to block shots and just generally be a menace. Notre Dame had no way of scoring against Duke. They only put up sixty one points in the whole game at home. Uh, twenty eight only twenty eight of them in the first half. Duke was Duke was locking them down all over the place. And Zion Williamson uh, just to just to continue the the madness of his freshman season, his only season in Durham, ten for twelve from the field. He made I think his first five shots. Uh, had 26 points on on 12 shots, just an incre- another incredible game from him. And it's not like he did anything that was so nuts. I mean, he had a few of those he had a few of those layups where he starts at the free throw line, and you're like, oh, what's he? How's he going to get to the rim? Oh, th- there he goes. He's at the rim. Like it didn't even like it didn't even matter. Like it wasn't it wasn't hard for him at all. Um, he had a few more of those plays tonight against Notre Dame, and generally, I felt like the team was really was really clicking at both ends. Um, the most impressive thing to me was that was the rate that they were making threes um, hit over 50% of their three point shots tonight. And we're taking those shots in rhythm. RJ Barrett, I think had more good three point looks tonight than he's had all season. And, and that's, it's not just that he was making them, but that the offense was flowing in a way that he was able to get them in good spots and in rhythm so that he was set up to make them. So uh, can can I talk about Zion just for a second? And yeah, I mean, I mean, just keep going. It, just 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 keep yeah. it keep it happening. <laughs> can you talk about oh, him? I don't oh know my if god! You can. One, so you get, Jason, you get one second. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Has there ever been a block shot that should have been a goaltending that made ESPN's top ten? Because what Zion did, uh, I, I don't remember the exact moment. Um, you know, in terms of the minutes. But I don't even need to tell you guys. Everyone knows the shot we're talking about. The one he takes off the backboard. He's inhuman. There were so many in this game that were like surprising, like out of nowhere. That has to be so intimidating for the opposing team to be like, where, where's that dude? Where is he coming from? They had no, they, I would be afraid to play with him. 
because I would just know that what I was going to put up was going to get blocked. I mean, Zion Williamson, I, Zion Williamson on the weak side is just about the scariest thing that, yeah, that, that you can see as a basketball team. But, but, but wait, uh, how about the possession where he's guarding, uh, I forget the kid's name, the Notre Dame point guard who, who had a great game, who's really quick off the dribble and stuff. And this guy's like, okay, I got Zion one-on-one. I'm going to shuck and jive and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, move him around and I'm going to get around him. And, and the dude couldn't shake Zion at all. Like not even close. So he he said, "Oh well, I got to bail out. I'm stuck here." And he did a step back jumper, and Zion blocked it. That was like blocked it straight up in the air. Mm-hmm. That what you you don't see a big man do that to a point guard. That's like impossible. This dude. So uh, I think we have been given a really rare gift to watch this guy. It sounds like I'm being silly here, but I'm really being serious. He plays with so much joy. He might be the most exciting player to ever wear a Duke uniform. I'm serious about that. And, and, and though I really want and hope and pray that Duke wins a national championship because this is a, an incredible team, even if this season falls short of our goals, I will mark this as one of the most enjoyable seasons I've ever had watching Duke play because I'm seeing the birth of a legend. I truly believe that. He's only going to be here for one year, but – I think that when you ask me who are the greatest guys ever to wear the Duke uniform, I'm not talking about once they go to the pros and, you know, hey, Jason Tatum's career has taken off and someday will he be one of the best Dukies? You know, no, no. He was only here for one year and and his one year at Duke, he was good, but it's not like he was the player of the year or anything like that. Zion Williamson in his one year, I think I'm going to have to like think about reevaluating my top five, top 10 Dukies of all time. My all-time starting five is Jay Will at point guard, JJ at shooting guard, Grant at small forward, Shane at power forward, and Christian Leitner at center. And I'm trying to figure out if I need to fit Zion in there someplace. Could Zion Williamson be better than Shane Battier? Am I actually thinking about that? Donald? Hey, hey, don't, 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 don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. We're not going to talk about this right now. We don't have time to discuss top tens and stuff let's wait till after the season on that okay because, okay yeah but he's a joy it's to be a conversation <laughs> <laughs> uh but here no the uh the other thing i was gonna mention about zion real quickly is do you guys did you guys see um when he attempted a block on uh jason mooney and just missed him and and, and caused him to foul him and jason mooney hit the ground and jumped up and started like to take a few steps at zion and then realized the like, Zion with doing? Thanos. Oh yeah, that was <laughs> and that stopped was real quick. <laughs> that was stupid. He was he. That's uh, th- that's that moment where you where you're like, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe this. It's it's that like you realize like, oh man, I have made a terrible mistake. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. You know, it's like it's like in the movies if if like you follow the bad guy into the alley, like that's don't do that. Uh, don't open that door. Don't don't go in the house when the when when the guy in the mask is coming at you. Um, don't don't. Don't stare down Zion Williamson after he he hits you in the into the deck. Um, nothing good is coming to you after that. Uh, Sam, I want to I want to ask you quick. I know we kind of hijacked your uh, your your review here, uh, but I want to talk a little bit back on the three point uh, shots that we did. And looking at it, you know, we went ten for nineteen. I'm sorry, three yeah, ten for nineteen from three tonight. But during the broadcast, they mentioned something very specific that I thought was a good point. Jason Williams talked about how uh, – and, and Seth Greenberg, who doesn't make a lot of good points, made actually a good point. He started out by saying that we made our first two baskets of the game were both open three-pointers that came off of an extra pass. And it was with Trey Jones, who is normally like a 25% three-point shooter, and he made his first one. And then Cam Reddish, who has been shooting basically like 20% during ACC season, hit his first one. What do you think this does for the confidence of a team when you have guys starting to make three pointers early and and knowing that, that seeing that ball go through the net and saying, okay, I'm having a night that we can, you know, take a couple of these and they're going to go in. I mean, it puts you in a position where the game just feels like the blue devils are cruising the whole way. Uh, The the shooting I think has been perhaps the worst thing about this team this year. The defense, the defense, both in the apps, in the in the interior and the exterior, the defense has been so strong. It's not like there's there's a particular missing link on defense, and um, the offensive execution is still very good. Obviously, they're still I think Duke is still top five in both 
in both offense and defense in Ken Palm. Yeah, they, well, they're, they're sixth in defense now, but um, fourth in offense. Yeah. Like the, the, the team is obviously able to score. RJ Barrett and Zion Williamson can get to the rim so well. But if Duke is able to make even even like an average percentage of the three point shots, not even like the, the 50% that they were hitting tonight, um, if they can even hit an average number, like a 35, 36%, um, the, the team is incredibly scary. And and if if Cam Reddish and Trey Jones and you know some combination of O'Connell and Barrett are able to hit threes, I think I think a bunch of different guys hit threes tonight. Um, this team is really hard to stop if that's the case. Yeah, we're un, we're unbeatable if we're hitting our threes. I'll I'll go ahead and say that if Duke hits Duke hits more than fifty percent of their threes in a the game, they're not losing that game. Period. End of story. I don't care who they're playing: Michigan State, Virginia, I, Kansas. Who cares? Doesn't matter. If Duke hits fifty percent of their threes, they're not losing the game. That that's that's all you need to know. But we're not going to hit fifty percent of our threes very often. So uh, I mean, we uh, we're great at a lot, lot, lot of things. We're not great at three point shooting. So a game like this, it was you know it was really good to see because when guys see the ball go through the, go through the basket, good things happen for them. And and, and I want to, did, did you guys notice the 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 three minute Cam Reddish run in the second half? Do um, tell. I, I, I really. Yeah, I I really want to note this. Um, and now, look, Duke was cruising. You know, hell, we were cruising this whole game. I mean, this wasn't a game. In less than five minutes, this wasn't a game. But Cam Reddish had um, ha- had had a moment in the second half at, at three minutes um, from about the eight and a half or nine minute mark to about the five and a half or six minute mark. Um, he hit a three pointer from the corner, and and you saw like a little extra bounce in his step after he did. I think it really helped him to see the ball go through and literally on the next possession he had a really nice driving layup that he 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 goes in the lane a fair bit and ta- tries these sort of shots that zion and and rj make and and cam like never makes them but this time he made one um and then on the next possession he had a three that like i mean it rattled out it was 99 percent in and then it, it somehow didn't get all the way in and it rattled out but it was a it, it was a good looking shot. He was in rhythm. Uh, you know, it's a shot that goes down 18 times out of 19. Um, and then like a, a possession or two later, he hit another three pointer. And then on the next possession, he got fouled on a drive and he hit a couple free throws. The dude scored 10 points in three minutes. And just, he looked like, he looked like the player everyone expected Cam Reddish to be not the player that he's been for the past month or so. And, and man, if, if that Cam Reddish, look, he doesn't have to score 10 points in three minutes all the time. But if Cam Reddish can score, you know, can even hit two three-pointers a half for Duke, he hit two in three minutes in this stretch. It's just huge. It's just huge for the team. Um, uh, God, please, Cam, please find your stroke. <laughs> All right, I think that's going to do it for this week, uh, at least the last eight days. Uh, But next up for the Blue Devils is a date in Cameron Saturday against St. John's. We seek to avenge the loss that we had to the Red Storm last year in Madison Square Garden. And this is that semi-regular non-conference game that we tend to schedule in the middle of AC season. So, Jason, let's break down the Johnnies. Tell us what we need to do Saturday to get the win. Hello, Shimori Pons. Um, Duke fans will remember this guy because uh, he torched us last year. Um, he is uh, He's their point guard. He's their team leader. He is far and away the best offensive player on their team. The ball is in his hands more than anyone else on that Notre Dame, uh, sorry, on that St. John's club. Um, he's, a, he's a very good shooter from outside, hits close to 40% of his threes, 38% of his threes. He is very good taking the ball um, uh, to the basket. Uh, dude hits 56% of his two point shots, hits 80% of his free throws. Um, he is Notre Dame's primary assist guy. Uh, he does everything for them on offense. Shamori Pons is uh, probably a future NBA player. And I am Jason, dying. Jason, if you remember, yeah. if you remember last at the end of last season during NBA draft declaration season, Shamori Pons was arguably the most prominent yeah, he was in the conversation. Who elected yeah. not to come, not to enter the draft and come back to school. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I am so excited to see the matchup 
between him and Trey Jones. I can I consider Trey to be the best defensive guard in the country right now. There are probably some guys on Texas Tech and perhaps some guys in Virginia who would argue with me, but Trey's in the conversation. And Shamori Pons is one of the best offensive point guards in the country, perhaps the best offensive point guard in the country. So uh, I, this this is a, a, a going to be a great matchup. I'm really excited for it, and I think that um, uh, you know this if if St. John's is going to have a chance in this game, it's going to be because Shimori Pons is able to get the best of Trey Jones. Now, do I think that's going to happen? Probably not. This this the St. John's team is really struggling lately. They they were they won their first twelve games of the year. Now they didn't beat anyone all that good. Um, I mean, they had a three point win over Georgia Tech. You know, they beat teams like Cal and Rutgers, Virginia Commonwealth, not good teams. Um, but they were 12-0. and 0. So St. John's was looking pretty strong. And then they got into the Big East play, and they haven't been nearly as good in Big East play. They've lost four of their past five games, um, uh, it, it, you know, including a couple, some bad losses. They lost by 11 points to Georgetown, lost by nine points to Butler. Um, they, they have not been performing very well lately, and – uh, you know, it is going to be very tough for them playing playing Duke. Um, I, I've uh, you know I say this a lot about Duke's opponents. I just have a tough time seeing where St. John's is is going to find success. Um, uh, you know, against Duke um, to to be able to change what what seems like sort of a foregone conclusion of a game. Um, the one thing I'll say for St. John's to keep an eye on is. Duke is incredibly good at making teams turn the ball over. I've mentioned this many times. St. John's is one of the best teams in the country at holding on to the ball. They are the fourth best team in the country uh, in terms of turnover percentage. Um, so it's going to be really interesting. You know, I talked about Shamori Pons versus Trey Jones. Um, uh, it's going to be St. John's not turning the ball over against a Duke team that demands that you turn it over so we can turn that into instant offense. Uh, you know, those are the two major battles that are coming in this game. Yeah, and I think that the um, the revenge factor for Duke is is motivating here. Even if a lot of the key players for the Blue Devils weren't on the squad last year, they all remember going up to Madison Square Garden. The guys who were left remember going up to Madison Square Garden and, and underperforming against the St. John's team that was uh, good, but certainly not on Duke's level last year, and definitely not on Duke's level this year. They're they're in the fifties in Ken Palm, um, sort of just outside the bubble. I think Jason, you talked about how early in the season St. John's was kind of feasting on, on not such great talent and probably peaked when they um, beat Marquette a few weeks ago. Since then it, it's been, it's been pretty rough for them. And uh, I, I, I'm like you, I kind of expect Duke to, um, to be able to win fairly easily in this one. Uh, although it is another one of those noon games on a Saturday. So uh, hopefully the blue devils are awake and, and Cameron's awake for this game. This episode of the Duke Basketball Report podcast is brought to you by the fine gentlemen of Bird Campbell, PA. Bird Campbell, a business law firm with offices in Florida and Texas. And on top of that, they bleed Duke blue just like we do. If you are in need of legal services and live in Florida or Texas, consider Bird Campbell. You can find them on the web at birdcampbell.com. And we thank them for their continued support of the program. So, guys, we're done with basketball, and I wanted to dive real quick into football and discuss the 2019 Senior Bowl, which took place this last Saturday. Uh, our very own Daniel Jones participated in the game for the North team and led them to a 34-24 victory over the South. Uh, Jones came in in the third quarter and just basically went off on one drive. Eight for 11, 110 yards, a touchdown. He also rushed for a touchdown and was voted the game's most valuable player. This comes amid speculation by a lot of pundits that Daniel Jones will be a first round pick in the upcoming NFL draft. And I don't know if you guys saw the game, but there was a moment after one of Jones's touchdowns where John Gruden, who was coaching the North team, uh, he was, he was slapping Raider stickers on uh, helmets as a way to remember standout performances. And he slapped one on Jones's helmet as he came off on the sideline reminder, ladies and gentlemen, the Raiders have the fourth pick in the NFL draft. So that was mildly interesting. So guys, uh, I don't know. I only saw a piece of it. I don't know if you guys seen it, but the question is, what do you think an MVP performance in the senior bowl 
does for Daniel Jones's chance to be picked in the first round. Sam, I'll go to you first. Uh, I'm, look, I'm not going to pretend to be the NFL draft expert here, but it can't be a bad thing. Uh, the more exposure he gets and the more hype he gets, I think is great for him. Uh, there's only, even though he, he started for a long time at Duke, it's not like Duke is a, you know, is one of these premier college football programs. And the more Daniel Jones can stand out among his similarly gifted peers who are coming from programs across the country, I think the better. Um, so great job by him and, and really excited to see where he ends up. Hopefully um, not in, in one of these dysfunctional NFL organizations, but hopefully somewhere that's going to really um, train him up to, to become an NFL quarterback. You know, the thing I'll say about Jones is he needed that MVP performance because all the reports out of practice and granted I wasn't at practice, but a lot of guys um, who are, you know, draft experts were watching these practices and they said that Jones did not have a great week of practice. He was throwing some interceptions that weren't great. Um, and uh, it, his his accuracy wasn't what some people had sort of touted and thought it was going to be. Um, and there there was a fair bit of talk coming into the game that Daniel Jones maybe was playing his way out of being a first round draft pick. Um, I think it's significant that Drew Locke of Missouri was selected as the starter for the team that Daniel Jones was on. Drew Locke and Daniel Jones are considered sort of two of the guy, two of the quarterbacks who, um, uh, you know, are, are sort of right in there as as a mid first round pick, perhaps. And the fact that Drew Locke was selected to start over Daniel Jones um, is not good for for Jones. But then Jones had a really nice game. And and look, the bottom line is there's going to be Duke's going to have a pro day where t NFL scouts will come watch Daniel Jones perform at Duke. Um, Jones is going to have a lot of uh, scouts watching him, you know, virtually every scout on the planet at the combine. I'm sure he'll be there and and hopefully he'll put up some impressive numbers and and look good. And, um, you know, he can he can make his way up the draft in that kind of way. But I think that this week, you know, though the public face of it was an MVP, um, the sort of private face of it was was disappointing practices, at least if the reports are to be believed. So Jones still has some work to do, I think, to convince NFL teams that he's uh, he's ready to be a first rounder. Yeah, and you know, I was reading some of those reports, Jason, in the uh, prelude to the Senior Bowl, and it was weird. It was he was the guy that they were talking about. Any mention of the Senior Bowl started with Daniel Jones, uh, standout quarterback for Duke University. And first of all, that right there is just in impressive in itself that, you know, out of all those guys on both rosters that people were leading with him and leading with Daniel Jones, Duke University, that only does wonders for our program and the interest peaks for, uh, you know, not just uh, scouts, but also recruits um, when they see that a guy from our uh, program does very well. So it was I thought I agree with you. I thought it was important that he did well. And I'm glad that he did, uh, you know, do well enough to earn the MVP. There are some people that were saying that he probably shouldn't have won MVP, but, uh, you know, he earned it and and really played well uh, with the opportunity that was given him. And that's what you can ask for. That's all I can ask for, guys. So uh, I hope this means that he is uh, going to, you know, stay in the first round. It sounds like uh, some of the reports after the game were saying that, just that, that the, he was probably going to stay in the first round. It's just a matter of where. But I did find it interesting that John Gruden um, laid a sticker on him. Uh, he didn't do it to many players, but he did it to the guys that he said he considered standouts uh, and or had standout performances. So uh, it's, it's always good to be recognized by uh, any NFL head coach, uh, even one that has the uh, has the 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 you know, resume that John Gruden has. He, of course, he didn't have a good season with the Raiders, but everyone knows him to be a guy who likes quarterbacks. Uh, and if a quarterback is earning his eye, um, that can only be a good thing for Daniel Jones. All right, guys, it is time for player of the week. I will start with you, Jason. Who do you got? I mean, is there even any question? Zion Williamson in the three games that we had in the past eight days shot 11 of 13 in one of them, nine of 12 in the next one and 10 of 12 in the next game. He was 30 for 37 from the field in the three games that we're covering 81%. And, and by the way, he's getting tons of rebounds. He's blocking shots. Like he's an alien from another planet. Um, I, 
he's bringing the ball up. He's playing defense like we've never seen a guy his size play defense. I've run out of superlatives. Of course, Zion Williamson is my player of the week. It's not even a question. But, but really quick, I just want to mention, uh, Cam Reddish actually did a great job of filling up the box score this week against Pitt. He had six rebounds, four assists. Against Tech, he had six rebounds, six assists, and five steals. Against Notre Dame, he had three assists, two steals. He had that flurry. So Cam Reddish maybe, I mean, I know he shot terrible against Georgia Tech, but maybe Cam is finding other ways to impact the game. And I just wanted to shout out to Cam. Hey, Zion's player of the week, but Cam, I, I feel you, babe. You're getting there. Keep going. Keep going. All right. Sam, who you got? I mean, I'm in agreement with Jason. You can't be picking guys other than Zion Williamson at this point. He's doing stuff that we've never seen Duke players do before. I talked a bit earlier about what a great week wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. He's doing stuff we've never seen anyone do before. Not just seen anyone do. Yeah. Um, I, I was saying that I, I noted what a great week Marquise Bolden had. Uh, because he's made some some really important, I think, incremental steps in his game at both ends of the floor. But what Zion's doing is just otherworldly, and and it has we have to keep recognizing it. Uh, I I don't care if people have Zion fatigue; it's that good. Um, people have LeBron fatigue; he's that good. Uh, so I'm going to just read his stat line um, uh, for the week. Uh, like you said, Jason, he went 30 for 37 for 73 points, 25 rebounds, 11 assists, eight hold up, blocks. Hold up! Hold up! Hold up! How many points did he have on how many shots? 73 points on 37 37 shots. shots. That's crazy. That's almost (laughs) two points per shot over three games. That's insane. And by the way, he never gets foul calls. He doesn't get free throws because the officials don't want to call fouls because he's so much bigger than those poor other guys trying to guard him. And a lot of his free throw attempts are as a result of and ones. Uh, But let me finish the stat line because I I only only got part of it. 73 points, 25 rebounds, 11 assists, eight blocks, five steals, and a partridge in a pear tree. Um, Yeah. Zion, three for three. Just keep being the Thanos you are. Xanos. I thought it was Xanos. All right, guys, we're going to end with parting shots. Uh, Sam, I'm going to go to you first. All right. I am not. This is I'm going to say this is slightly out of character for me. I am not known to come on here and uh, and share personal vendettas. I don't I don't carry a lot of personal vendettas. Oh, wait, I wait, need, wait, Sam, what? before you continue, are, yeah. am I sensing that you have something you have to say? I have I have something I need to say. OK, um, get it off your chest. Floor is so, yours. so look, uh, Obviously, I, I went to Duke for undergrad and stood in line for a lot of games and had to deal with um, no offense to Donald and to Jason, who were both both members of this uh, of this, I don't know, questionably elite society, the, the undergraduate line monitors. I had to deal with them for however many years that I was doing that. And uh, I complained a lot about the line monitors. Uh, I I always thought that that the line monitors were maybe taking a little bit too much advantage of their position that uh they perhaps were eh, lightly of using power but what can you expect from 19 and 20 year olds uh who are are given perhaps too much authority i figured that in graduate school coming back to duke that the grad stu- student ushers who are like the equivalent of the line monitors the folks who administer the rules for ingress into the stadium would be um would be perhaps um, more charitable and more understanding and more fair, but no, uh, corruption is is a disease uh, that permeates apparently throughout the entire student section in Cameron Indoor Stadium because uh, because the system that the grad students suffer is perhaps worse than the undergraduate students, especially if you if you went to Duke and uh, you know what it's like being a short person uh, in the student section. It's even worse as a graduate student than it was as an undergrad. Um, I got really fed up <laughs> during the game at just all of the inadequacy of the whole system on Saturday against Georgia Tech because I was shoved into a place where I couldn't even really see the game. Um, so I'm glad that I don't, I don't remember which of it, which of you it was that was recapping Georgia Tech primarily. I was in the building, but I, I couldn't really see what was going on. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to air that I am extremely upset with the grad student ushers. Um, I think that their system doesn't make any sense. It's it's an enormous waste. And it is uh, somewhat embarrassing that a bunch of Duke students could design such a bad system for letting people into the game 
Um, I sent them an email, a long, <laughs> detailed email about how I would fix their system. And uh, we'll see if they get back to me. Um, but just letting you guys know that you're on notice. And uh, some number of people listen to this podcast and also know it now, too. <laughs> I do remember, I, I do know your uh, constant battle with the uh, grad school ushers. I, I was, I've been present for two of them. And, and yeah, the system needs to be fixed. As someone, I have a sort as an of outsider. I, it, it, it needs to be some tweaking. Like and, I, I have a, uh, I have a sort of, sort of jolly way that I jolly, but 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 perhaps rude way that I treat them. Um, maybe maybe one of them listens here and and understands. Guys, you got to do better. It's embarrassing. Was your email as long as the emails that they send you guys, or have they shortened those? You know what? It was. <laughs> Oh my goodness! I didn't even talk about how bad the emails are that we get from the grad <laughs> student ushers. We get so before, um, season tickets that I that I won through the lottery, and before if you got season tickets, if you have a season ticket package for the grad students, before every game, like two or three days before every game, you get this email that has all the game day information, and it's like Donald. I mean, it, it would probably take you six minutes to read the whole email if you were to if you were to actually read every word of it. It has all this superfluous information that um, that could definitely just be on a website somewhere. Most of it is exactly the same game to game other than, you know, the, the opponent and the game time. And therefore like what time you have to be in line to make sure you get a wristband to get, to get back in line and get into the game. Um, oh, it's awful. No, the email that I sent them was not quite as long as the email they send us every week, but it was damn close. Um, <laughs> it was, it was detailed. I, I, I don't think it's necessary for me to read the whole thing here on the show, but um but I guess if you want to see it, I could send it to folks if they if they wanted to see it. So I guess just like hit us up at dbrpodcast at gmail dot com, and maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll share it with you. Just just share it with me and Jason because uh, I'm worry, sure I'll want to read it. <laughs> it, it, it. It's coming to you guys. It's uh, I I think it's a damn good bit of prose from uh, you know personally. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> um, all right, Jason, give us your parting shot. I think you're going to the NBA, aren't you? I am. I want to talk about a dookie in the NBA. And uh, let's be honest, um, Jalil Okafor, Jalil Okafor seemed uh, a short time ago like he was on his way to being one of the biggest busts in NBA draft history. Um, I, 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 I kid you not. I mean, this guy was a huge mega bust. I think everyone sort of knows that he had been tossed aside um, in Philadelphia, the team that that used an incredibly high draft pick on him, um, Brooklyn. He went to Brooklyn, and they basically found him useless. They didn't even, uh, you know, they they made no indication at all that they wanted to have him back. And and so in this off season, I thought someone would take a risk on him, um, and and no one. There was not much interest in him at all. The New Orleans Pelicans ended up signing Jalil Okafor to one of the worst contracts in the NBA. They signed him to a, a minimum contract, a veteran minimum contract. It was the absolute least amount of money they could pay him. And they signed him for two years with a club option, which means if he, they would bring him back at the NBA minimum again. If he, usually if you play really well, you get a chance to sign for a bigger contract, you know? But no, like the Pelicans thought so little of him that, that he had to sign a two-year deal with a club option. And Jalil Okafor basically wasn't playing for New Orleans for much of this year. From, from like the beginning of November until the middle of December, a span of 23 games, 23 games, Jalil Okafor played 13 minutes total. 13 minutes in 23 games. He was barely on their roster. I really, really thought this was a guy who was going to have to go to Europe or something to to have any kind of NBA career. And and, and then sort of out of nowhere, he started to get a little bit of time for them in mid-December. A week ago, Anthony Davis, who's you know one of the top two or three players in the NBA and the whole reason that the New Orleans Pelicans exist, <laughs> Anthony Davis got hurt. And suddenly they had to play Jalil. Let me tell you what Jalil Okafor has done in the past four games for the New Orleans Pelicans subbing for Anthony Davis. He's averaging almost 20 points per game, 19.75 points per game, 10.75 rebounds per game, almost three blocks per game. And I want to point out Jalil Okafor always thought of as a terrible, terrible defensive player for him to be getting around three blocks per game for him to be protecting the rim. That is a major, major change in his game. 
from an NBA standpoint. And by the way, he's done all this while being stupidly efficient. He is 36 of 48 from the field in his past four games, 75% shooting in the NBA. Those are Zion Williamson kind of numbers, people. I mean, <laughs> what Jalil Okafor is doing the past four games subbing for Anthony Davis is nothing short of amazing. And I, I did not see this coming in any way, shape, or form. And I'm so happy for this guy because his career has been such a disappointment. I mean, the NBA changed the moment he, like the moment he arrived, he was a back to the basket post player in the NBA. The moment he arrived sort of went, wait a second, we don't want that anymore. All we want is guys who can shoot three pointers. Hey, Jock, can you shoot a three? And he was like, no. And, and he was suddenly worthless to the NBA. So I'm so happy for this guy that he is breaking out. And, and by the way, Anthony Davis is now asking for a trade, not because he wants to get away from Jalil, but because he wants to get away from new Orleans, but there is a non-zero possibility that Anthony Davis will be dealt from New Orleans and the new New Orleans Pelicans starting center playing big minutes for them in the very near future could be Duke's own Jalil Okafor um, with one of the best comeback stories you'll hear about in the NBA. Yeah, that that Woj Bob that dropped this morning about Davis uh, wanting requesting a trade and indicating that he would not return uh, or sign an extension to return to the Pelicans. That it, It's been a great week for John. I'm glad that you brought that up, Jason. My parting shot also stays in the NBA, and it goes more towards NBA All-Star Weekend. In my opinion, the best All-Star Weekend that exists. Uh, it's a fun weekend, and I want to highlight a couple of Dukies that are going to be representing that we know of so far. A lot of the field is still being filled in for some of these uh, events. But Kyrie Irving, once again, voted as a starter in the All-Star Game out of the Eastern Conference. Uh, we'll see that draft uh, later on this week once they fill in the reserves. But in the three-point contest, we have our boy Seth Curry. He's going to be in the field. Uh, he leads – I'm sorry, as uh, entering today, he is second in the in the league in three-point percentage with 48.1%. And he's going to be going up against his brother, Seth Curry. Uh, I'm sorry, Steph Curry. Seth and Steph will be on the, on the floor uh, competing in the three-point contest. I'm not sure if this is the first time that two brothers have competed in the three-point contest against each other. Um, we'll have to fact check that later on. Uh, but in the field so far, we have Buddy Heald, Damian Lillard, and Dirk Nowitzki um, going up against the Curry brothers. Uh, so I, this is going to be an awesome event. Uh, you know, all the events on the All-Star Weekend are usually really, really fun. Uh, we'll see probably guys like Jason Tatum, uh, maybe even uh, Marvin Bagley um, and Wendell Carter um, going up in the Rising Stars Challenge, which is the first and second years. But Seth Curry, um, a guy that Jason, uh, you talk about career trajectory. He was one of those guys that was barely getting 10 day contracts uh, just a couple years ago. And now he, he has a two year guaranteed deal with the Portland Trailblazers and has repaid them by having an electric year um, from behind the arc. So it's very good to see him uh, doing so well and can't wait to see him go in the three point contest against his brother and against the rest of the NBA. I, I don't think there's ever been another set of brothers to compete. I, the only other ones that would be possible, I think, are John and Jim Paxson. Um, and I don't think the Paxson, but uh, first of all, I'm not even certain the NBA had a three point contest, but it probably, yeah, yeah, it did. It did, but contest, I don't think they competed against each other. I don't think they competed yeah, but against Jason, each other. Jason, yeah. that's like saying that the best, the best uh, brother duo in, in Major League Baseball history is Hank Aaron and, and his brother, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, hey, by the way, I, I'm glad you brought up the the All Star Game in Charlotte and the fact that the two Charlotte boys, the Curry brothers, are going to be playing there. I I do want to tip my cap to Charlotte and the state of North Carolina for getting this All Star Game, because as you guys may recall, a couple of years ago, the All Star Game was pulled from Charlotte because of the transgender bathroom bill thing, silliness. I don't want to get into politics too much, but the bathroom bill was really, really silly and stupid. And, and the NBA took away the all-star game. Um, and, and I know Charlotte is very excited to have gotten the game back for 2019. And uh, I think they're going to put on a great show. And, um, and, and in addition to the Curry brothers who are Charlotte natives, um, uh, fans of the Charlotte Hornets have managed to uh, vote Kemba Walker as a starter in the all-star game. Kemba Walker is that Charlotte Hornets franchise far, far, far and away their best player. Now he's the guy who makes that team relevant. And it's great to, that he's going to get to start um, on his home floor for an all-star game. 
So yeah, uh, and he and, uh, yeah, and on top of that, great. he yeah. earns it. Like it's not like he, oh, yeah. you know, it's not like a petty vote in. Like with some, you know, how some in all in a baseball all star games, you'll see like you know eight Mariners when it's in Seattle, and none of them deserve to be there. It was it was well deserved by Kimba Walker. He's had a ridiculous year. Absolutely. And you know what, guys? I think that's going to do it here with episode 145 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Remember out there, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, or Google Play. And if you leave us a nice, cushy review, we would certainly be grateful. As always, big time sponsor, uh, our big time sponsor is Bird Campbell. We thank you guys so much for your continued support. Sam and Jason, thank you guys. Fans, we'll be back next week. But this is episode 145 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. So Duke band, take us home.